From the doorstep of the Rocky Mountains, it's Go West Young Podcast, your show where parks, politics, and policy come together for a barbecue. I'm Aaron Weiss at the Center for Western Priorities in Denver, and I am so excited for today's guest. You may have seen stories about Micah Meyer. He's the guy who visited every single National Park Service site in one giant three-year road trip. I wanted to dive into more than just his favorite parks, although, of course, we will do that, too. But Micah's story is a whole lot more than just Instagramming our parks. It's about personal identity and faith and setting out to do something that seems impossible or at least very expensive without a life savings to fall back on. Plus, we will bring you the story, or maybe it's more of a tall tale, about the only woman known to have robbed a stagecoach in the Arizona Territory. And before we get started, a little housekeeping. We are taking this podcast on the road. We're going to be doing a series of live shows across the West this summer. Nothing big, just a few guests, maybe a few beers, talking about public lands and environmental issues that communities are facing right now across the West. We want to have a conversation with activists, with scientists, maybe a politician or two. If you have thoughts about who we should talk to or where we should go, go ahead, drop us an email, podcast at westernpriorities.org. And of course, we will bring you more details as this plan comes together over the summer. Now, let's do the news. If at first you don't succeed, keep trying to bring back coal. That is the order of the day at the Bureau of Land Management. You will remember last month, a judge found that then-Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke jumped the gun when he reversed an Obama-era order that paused new coal leasing on public lands. So, just a few weeks later, BLM did just that. They've released a draft environmental assessment on the impacts of restarting coal leasing. It is quite the read. BLM says it won't consider the social cost of carbon, that is to say, the economic damage caused by extra coal mining, because in part, and I am quoting here, the full social benefits of coal-fired energy production have not been monetized. Yeah. So you now have less than 15 days to tell Interior Secretary David Bernhardt what you think of this plan. We have already talked a lot on this podcast about the various ways the Trump administration is cutting the public out of decision-making. Making a huge decision like this, with only 15 days to comment, is about as egregious as it gets. We do have a link to the public comment form in the show notes. And speaking of cutting out the public, political appointees at Interior are interfering with requests under the Freedom of Information Act. Jacob Holtzman at CQ Roll Call reported on this story based on documents that we obtained here at the Center for Western Priorities. It is called the Awareness Review Process. If political appointees come up in a FOIA response, those appointees get to see that response before it goes out the door. But we have proof that they are not just reviewing those responses. In one case, the Interior Department spokesperson, Heather Swift, stepped in when she was given 96 pages of materials about Lola Zinke, the wife of Ryan Zinke. Swift, in an email, claimed that a number of pages are non-responsive even after the FOIA officer pushes back. And we don't know exactly what happened after that, but the final FOIA response that was given to Western Values Project somehow shrunk from 96 pages to just 16. 80 pages somewhere along the way vanish, even though the Freedom of Information Act officer said these are responsive. And this is not a one-time thing. We've also got a memo from the National Park Service FOIA office in D.C. in which civil servants reveal that out of 10 FOIA requests sent up to political appointees for review, FOIA officers had been told to hold back issuing responses on nine of them. Nine out of 10. The memo makes it clear, quote, delays resulting from the awareness review process are preventing the Park Service from meeting its legal obligations under the Freedom of Information Act. Such delays leave NPS open to potential litigation, which could result in the assessment of attorney's fees. Needless to say, this memo will be of serious interest to attorneys who are already suing 
or thinking about suing the Interior Department for refusing to release documents under FOIA. I love our national parks. You are listening to this podcast, so you probably love our national parks. But do you love our national parks enough to visit every single one of them? That is what Micah Meyer did, an epic three-year journey to not just every national park, but all 419 sites run by the National Park Service. At the end of April, Micah's trip came to an end on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, surrounded by friends and family and fans who followed his journey on Instagram and Facebook. Micah joins us on the line from, uh, where are you now, at Minneapolis? I am, that's correct. I, are you adjusting to, to life back in the real world? It is so much harder than I thought. I I realized it took me about two weeks to verbalize sort of the feeling I was having, but I realized that for three years, I woke up every day and I knew what my short-term goal was that day, what I needed to accomplish and how that fit into a three-year goal and my entire life. And now I wake up not in a parking lot, not in a van and with sort of this less clear sense of urgency every day and my brain doesn't know how to handle it. So take us back three years. This started out as a, a tribute to your late father, but it, it turned into a whole lot more than that. Yeah. You know, my dad loved road trips and that was one of the ways that we bonded before he passed. And then when I was 19, he he died from esophageal cancer. And so I never got to take the road trips with him during college and beyond that I expected I would. So I've done one road trip every year since he passed as a way to try to keep that connection alive. And along the way, realized that most of my peers seemed to think they were guaranteed to make it to 80. And since my dad passed away at 58, I had to learn that that's not the case the hard way and wanted to do something crazy when I turned 30 that would hopefully grab their attention and share this message. And I figured what more relatable way to reach the entire world than our National Park Service sites. So walk us through the logistics. You come up with this crazy idea, but how do you actually turn that into a game plan for a 75,000 mile road trip mm. over however many years? Yeah. So I spent, I spent my twenties saving up money to, to launch this project. And at age 28 realized it was time to start planning in earnest. So really I spent a solid two years uh, doing everything from research on weather patterns to best routes, to most efficient ways to reach these sites, to when each park was open, since some are only open seasonally, to potential sponsors I could reach out to, to the most uh, practical way to live on the road, to access these sites, talking to experts, getting help crafting the schedule, so sort of doing everything I could ahead of time to be best prepared for launch day when that came on April 29th, 2016. And then, of course, on top of all those miles, you can't drive to Hawaii or American Samoa or Guam or Puerto Rico or the, the Virgin Islands. You, you've got some some planes and boats to try and both factor in and fund as part of this. It, it can't, couldn't have been a, a cheap endeavor. Right. And that was the scariest thing was I began this journey with what park experts told me was only a fifth of the amount of money of what it would take to do this. And so I sort of got in that driver's seat and drove away on a, on a big leap of faith that Somehow, in the following three years, I could figure out a way to make this sustainable and complete it. So you had funding, and then part of this, you were you were preaching and, and passing the hat along the way. At what point did you realize that was going to be part of, of this trip for you? Yeah, well, when I planned it, I sort of Pollyanna-ish looked around at the world of social media and saw millennials funding epic travels by getting sponsors. And I thought, well, I'll just do that. And then I learned really quickly that if you don't have over 100,000 followers, nobody really cares. And particularly in the outdoors industry, there were no openly LGBT people that had any sponsorships. The recreation industry had never had a Pride Month ad. So I sort of knew going in that I would have to fight this uphill battle of not fitting the outdoorsy image and also not having a huge social following that that companies would require. And so I figured I would crowdfund this journey. And there was a total failure at first. I would do media sharing this journey. And I just got nasty emails from people who called me a trust fund kid, which they obviously didn't read the article because they would know that pastors don't have trust funds. But everyone was just really negative And 
I found that unless unless I had the chance to talk to people and explain the real reason why I was doing this trip, it wasn't just a vacation as they assumed, but the meanings behind it. Once they knew that, they were really excited to help. And so it took me about nine months to figure out how to do that. But uh, I began using my background as a professional singer. I'd spent over a decade singing professionally, including at our national cathedral, and started out just singing for my supper and would pass out the hat. And then churches started asking me to preach the sermon and figure out a way to to tie the story of this journey into a message that that spoke to the people there. And here I am three years later. So on top of all that, you're obviously then visiting the parks themselves. How much time were you able to spend in each park? Or, or did you feel like you had to you know, show up, get to the visitor center, take a selfie and, and hit the road again? <laughs> Yeah, that's another thing is a lot of people assumed that I was sort of Chevy chasing my way and touching the parks and leaving, um, that they, they thought I was just doing it to set a record, which the records were a happy coincidence that happened from this initial goal. So I was really fortunate in that when I was planning this journey, just by pure coincidence, about five miles east of me lived one of the three or so dozen people who at that point had visited all the park service sites. And so... One night he came over for dinner and I got out my spreadsheet and I went through every single site and said, if you could go back here, what would be the ideal amount of time you would spend? And those are the days and the data that I used to come up with this three year route. So really the intention and the actual experience was to spend the ideal amount of time that each site suggests, whether that's a historic site that you can do everything in a few hours or a place like the Grand Canyon, where you really want to spend a week rafting down the middle. I made sure that that's what I did. There was no touch and goes. So this has left you then with a very unique appreciation of the Park Service that, as you mentioned, only a few dozen people in the entire world might have. So I, I want to pick your brain here in a little bit of a speed round, uh-huh. uh, asking you to pick a few of your, your favorites, but with you know, kind of specific questions. Okay. What do you think is the most underappreciated national park? Uh, I would say our national lake shores. There are three of them now that Indiana Dunes became a capital N, capital P park. And I'm shocked by how many people don't know about them, despite their incredible beauty. Among the A-list, the e-ticket national parks, which one is absolutely every bit as good as advertised? Oh my gosh. I I stood at Glacier Point and watched sunset over Half Dome in Yosemite and was just blown away. And I, I know it's sort of the opposite of some of the things I said on this journey and that I was trying to share about the park sites you haven't heard of. But that's one that you have heard of that is very well visited, that absolutely delivers. What is the one park that everyone needs to see before they die? That's tough. I mean, what I learned about the Park Service is that there are so many sites that um, can be special to people with specific interests, uh, people who love a certain president or like Springfield Armory uh, that that chronicles our nation's history of of guns and and warfare. And if that's your interest, like you're going to love that place more than anything else. So I would say whatever site specifically speaks to you as far as your your personal interests. Uh, for myself, I was really enchanted and blown away in ways I never expected by Dinosaur National Monument. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I've heard that from many people who've been there and don't realize that that's one that I, I've heard a lot of folks suggest that that absolutely deserves national park status. Oh, the locals don't like me. I've gotten emails saying, stop telling everyone about our secret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the, the biggest surprise of a park that you, you maybe went in with low expectations and, and came out blown away? I really had a blast uh, at the, the site in Guam, the uh, War in the Pacific National Historical Park and the accompanying affiliated site on Saipan, which is the American Memorial Park. Um, both of them are, are technically just small parcels of land, but then they have pieces uh, of the history of America's involvement in World War II all around the islands. So really to fully experience these parks and the stories, you have to explore both the entire island of Guam and the entire island of Saipan. And that was just such a 
an incredible experience that looking at the names, the designations, this historical park and memorial park, you'd probably think it'd be like a statue in a building, but getting to fully experience this place means taking in the entire island culture. And it was really incredible. You mentioned rafting down the Colorado. What was the biggest thrill on your trip? Um, so I, my family grew up pretty poor and never got to do like, I mean, even we go to arcades and it was like too much to, to do quarters to do that stuff. So I, it was always like the cheapest way of traveling possible, nothing extra. And so getting to do a hot air balloon ride in South Dakota was like something I never imagined or getting to take a helicopter tour over Badlands National Park or Hawaii volcanoes. Like these are experiences that I always looked at at other families and saw that they could do, but assumed I would never get to do with my life. So because of this journey and sort of, I would trade, trade uh, coverage on my blog and social media for some of these tour opportunities, getting to do those extra special views of the parks just blew my mind. Were there any parks that you end up, ended up hitting either in the wrong season or Mother Nature just didn't cooperate? And you're, you're like, I would come back to you again if given the chance and, and, and take a do over. Yeah. I, one of the things I pride myself on is that sort of a lot of the, the hiccups that I think a lot of people expected would happen on this trip did not happen because I spent two years planning. And so I really did my research to make sure that, that I could hit these places when the weather was statistically most likely to be good. Um, however, California <laughs> threw me off because <laughs> Devil's Postpile National Monument can only be reached basically in July, like middle of July, August, and early September. And you're only a few hundred miles away from Death Valley National Park, which you do not want to be at during that time of year. So I actually had to fly from Alaska down to Yosemite and Devil's Post Pile, uh, just so I could reach Devil's Post Pile National Monument during that temperate time of year, because the rest of California I did in the spring uh, earlier that year. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a good detour there. We hear a lot about overcrowding in some parks, Zion, Yellowstone, Yosemite. Did you, you, did you run into that? And do you think that is a, a genuine problem that, that some of our parks are facing right now? Yeah, I mean, sort of one of the the side benefits of doing a lot of speaking at churches was that on my Sundays, I was often fundraising and on Saturdays, I was driving there. So I really grew to appreciate visiting the parks on Monday through Friday when it was a lot less crowded. But even on those days, like I was at Yellowstone in July and I had planned a number of days there and halfway through, I said, I can't take this anymore. Like, it's just so crowded you spend so much time just sitting in your car trying to get places, waiting for parking, that it sort of ruins the experience. And I had been to Yellowstone many years ago during May, and that was so much better just because the traffic is so nuts that it really is a detriment to the experience. So I think one of the things we're struggling with now is we have a, a park service and a park foundation that is promoting visiting these sites, rightly so, but we aren't keeping pace with the infrastructure that it takes to manage this increased number of visitors. And especially in the popular parks, the ones that are very well known and very well marketed, it really shows. So the maintenance backlog that we've we've heard about, we've talked about a bit on, on this podcast, from what you've seen, it's real uh, and, and urgent, at least in, in some places? Well, yeah, I mean, one thing I have to say is that the Park Service does an incredibly good job of working with what they have as a general visitor. Um, there were a lot of things that I either didn't notice or they did a good job of hiding or, or masking uh, as far as maintenance issues go, because in general, the majority of my experiences at parks, I never had to say like, Oh gosh, I wish I could do this, but it's broken and they don't have the money to fix it. So I give them a lot of credit for, for making do with what they have. But yeah, that being said, there are places that really need work done to make them capable of handling the amount of visitors they get. I assume over the course of these three years, you spoke to dozens or hundreds of park rangers and park service employees. Do you think there's a message that you have learned from them that if given the opportunity, you would pass along to the, the top leadership at the park service or at the interior department in DC? Um, 
For the Department of the Interior and the Park Service, I would just remind them how fortunate they are to have a staff that is so passionate about the mission that they are serving. I recently got to do a speaking engagement with an employee of the Park Service who mentioned that during a recent survey of all the government departments, the Park Service had the highest score as far as a staff believing in the mission of their department. And that was very evident anecdotally in my personal experiences. These are people who often uh, work service jobs during the off season just so they can keep having seasonal jobs because they haven't been able to become full time. Uh, They are people who are highly, highly educated, who work jobs that people might say are beneath their education, but they just love their job. They love their sites so much. So I would remind the the department heads, how lucky they are to have a staff that is so committed to the goals of their department. And to those higher up, those in Congress, I would ask that they go to our Park Service sites because one of the most frustrating things is to go to historic sites and see the United States make a mistake 400 years ago, make it somewhere else 300 years ago, another place 200, another place 100, and still today, and realize we haven't really learned from our history that we're preserving. So I sort of wish I could make Congress go to a lot of these places and hopefully it would impact the way they legislate. That's a great takeaway. You mentioned Dinosaur National Monument as as a big surprise. Any other sites you visited that you think need a promotion and deserve national park status? Um, Well, as far as needing a promotion, I, I really can't speak highly enough about the Dakotas. People laugh when I talk about how much I enjoyed them. Even (laughs) I talked about how much I like Theodore Roosevelt National Park so much that the superintendent emailed me at one point and said, I just can't believe how much you enjoyed it and how much you keep talking about it because North Dakota is so unvisited that their, their tourism board has something called the Save the Best for Last Club, where if it's your last state visited, they give you a pin and a t-shirt and a certificate because (laughs) so many people just put it off. And yet both Badlands National Park and Theodore Roosevelt National Park were some of the most spectacular experiences I had in the Park Service, some of the most unique places I saw that it's such a shame that people see the Dakotas and they think it's only boring prairie. So that's definitely one recommendation I'll give. Those are capital N, capital P parks. However, um, some of my other favorite sites that don't have that designation would include White Sands National Monument, absolutely incredible place. Wonderful experiences there. Uh, Buck Island Reef National Monument in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands was a spectacular experience. And there are some funny sites, kind of like um, I went to Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument and thought it was way better than Saguaro National Park. And I think about all the people that go to Saguaro because it's one of the big 61 and overlook Oregon Pipe Cactus because it's a national monument and think, man, are they missing out? So there definitely were a number of sites like that where I think maybe if politics was different and policies were different, sites that have certain statuses would have national park status to better reflect the experience that a visitor could have there. You mentioned getting an email from the the superintendent at, at Teddy Roosevelt. Any other favorite people you met along the way? I mean, you must run into all sorts of characters hitting 419 national park sites. Yeah, well, um, there are two that I think of. One of them was a ranger in Katmai National Park, and he reached out when I was planning my Alaska portion, and he's openly gay as well. And he said, you know, I really appreciate the visibility you're helping bring to us, especially those of us that work here. Um, I know Katmai is really hard and expensive, so if you need a place to stay, like you can, you can stay at my place in the park. And so that was really cool just to get to know him really well for a few days in this really fascinating park. And then a few months after I was there, he got reassigned to Hawaii Volcanoes and moved at the end of December, just as the shutdown happened. And so now knowing him on a personal level, I got to see the real life impact that the shutdown had because he had a new apartment with a deposit and it just shipped all his stuff and he's freaking out in Hawaii, no less in Hawaii. So from one of the most expensive parts of our country to another most expensive and he went weeks without a paycheck. And so I was heartbroken for him, but also sort of honored to get this window into the reality of our park rangers because even with these struggles, they're still so passionate 
And that brings me to another great experience. I was in Everglades National Park and doing a sluice log, which is where you're sort of hiking in, in muddy waters up to your knees that could have pythons and alligators in them. And the range is explaining this and our group is all scared. And she said, well, you don't have to, you got, you don't got to worry about nothing because I got the Lord and I got this stick. (laughs) And, uh, this ranger had described herself as a hillbilly from Alabama who served in the military to protect America while wearing green. And she finished and she wanted to protect America's nature now while wearing green. And I ended up running into her uh, again in dinosaur national monument And then again in Haleakala National Park because she worked seasonally. And it was fun to see her the second time to catch up. And then the third time to get to get an update from her on a really magical experience I had during this journey where a wild Canadian goose followed my rafting group for four days. And so when I saw her again, I got to say what happened to the goose because she was working there and was able to update. So some very fun connections that sort of spread the entire length of this journey. So your identity covers a whole lot of ground, obviously outdoor enthusiast, a gay man, a working preacher, a classically trained countertenor. How do you balance all of that on a trip this big when everything you do is being shared with the world in (laughs) real time? How do you find the real Micah in all of that mix? Yeah, I sort of joke that if uh, a gay Christian male soprano from the flattest state in America can devote three years of his life to visiting the national parks, don't tell me that there is an outdoorsy type and that you're not part of that. Because I sort of go against very many of the prototypes of what you'd expect. Um, It's been a fascinating journey, um, not just this physical one, but to start this trip sort of thinking I had to hide who I was for it to be successful. And then in the end, finding that it's only by embracing all of those unique traits about myself that this journey eventually survived and came to completion. So I'm positive that there were opportunities, sponsors that would have loved to have worked with me that did not because one or some of my identities or all were just too offensive or too risky. In fact, one of them told me in writing that they were dropping me suddenly because I was doing too much LGBT outreach. Wow. So yeah, it's been hard to to realize that that's a reality, but also really heartwarming to wake up every day and say, even if it's just this three-year trip, I figured out a way to do something that many people said was impossible. And for most of the journey, be entirely true to myself and wake up every day and say, this might be harder than I thought. It might be a rougher road than I thought. And it might be way more difficult to complete than I thought. But at least every day that I wake up, I know that I'm doing something that I feel like is making the world a better place and helping others. And if sharing those vulnerable parts of myself is able to help others, then it's entirely worth it. So your trip is Obviously, it's a once in a lifetime kind of dream that Mm -hmm. I I suspect everyone listening to this podcast is thinking, wow, I wish wish I could do that. You're now, what, 33, 34 years old. (laughs) You have a lifetime ahead of you having done a once in a lifetime trip. So so what's next for you? Yeah, well, as you said, this is the sort of thing so many people want to do. And and having done it, at least in the way that I did it, I, I say don't do what I did. If you are going to visit all the parks, figure out how to have your funding ahead of time um, or get on a Netflix show and be super famous so you can get sponsors easily because making this my job, um, both in fundraising and in putting out a product from my experience, made it a lot less personally fulfilling. So if you're going to do what I did, definitely do it just for yourself is my number one recommendation. But given that I have done this and had this experience and that so many people would like to know what it's like. I really want to use it and be able to share that as many ways as possible. So I've already begun doing speaking engagements for nonprofits, for colleges, for schools, for churches, for companies, where I'm taking the lessons learned and the experiences of this project and sharing it in in personal ways through speeches. I intend to spend the summer writing a book so that it's something that can be shared with people uh, on their own time at their own pace. And one of my big goals is to 
do a travel show next. I would sort of love to bounce off of Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown and do a show called Parks Unknown. <laughs> and whether that's U.S. sites or parks around the world, since we've exported this park service idea so well, continue to take people to places that they might not get to visit otherwise. All right. Last question before I let you go. If you had to pick just one national park to live the rest of your life in, where would you go? Oh, you know, it's funny because every time I go to the city, I, I'm sort of overrun with the urbanity of it. But that is what makes Golden Gate National Recreation Area so incredible. Is It is this stunning California coastline. And it is right next to an urban area that is so dense, that is so noisy, that is so dirty, that it wants to just drive you mad. But then you walk a few steps out of it and you're suddenly surrounded by tall trees and cliff views and the rolling fog comes in and you just feel so fortunate that the designers of the city kept this place natural because I couldn't imagine living in that city and not having access to that, that nature so close. So if I had to pick one place, it would be there. Good choice. Micah Meyer is the first person, as far as anyone can tell, to visit all 419 National Park Service sites in a single epic trip. Uh, we've got links to his website and his Instagram feed in the show notes. It is obviously one heck of a photo album. Micah, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you so much. I'll see you all on the road. Time for a look back at this week in Western history. A couple of musical May birthdays of note. Singer Stevie Nicks was born this week in 1948 in Phoenix. Her father was a food executive who kept the family on the move. She also grew up in Albuquerque, El Paso, Salt Lake City, L.A., and the Bay Area. It was there that she met Lindsey Buckingham during her senior year of high school. And the rest, of course, is Fleetwood Mac history. Also, happy birthday to Jewel Kilcher, better known just as Jewel, born this week in Payson, Utah, although she grew up in Homer, Alaska, with no running water, just a coal stove and an outhouse. Her grandfather, by the way, was a delegate to the Alaska Constitutional Convention. Jewel and her father played in roadhouses and hotels in Anchorage as a father-daughter duo, and then after studying music at the Interlochen Arts Academy in Michigan, she got her big break playing coffee houses in San Diego. It was also this week in 1899 that a sometimes singer named Pearl Hart held up a stagecoach in Arizona. Now, I love this story of Pearl Hart. It's one of these Wild West tales that is impossible to nail down. You read three different accounts of her life, you'll get six different versions of what happened. But here is the gist of it. She was born Pearl Taylor in Ontario, Canada. Her parents were well off. She went to finishing school. As a teenager, she eloped with a gambler and a drunkard named Fred Hart, or maybe his name was Frank Hart. Pearl and Fred, or Frank, ended up in Chicago at the World's Fair of 1893, where Pearl was entranced by Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Pearl left her abusive husband and got on a train to Trinidad, Colorado, where she became a saloon singer and discovered she was pregnant. She sent the child back to her mother in Canada, or maybe her mother was in Ohio at that point. Somewhere along the way, Pearl ended up back in Phoenix, and she realized that the old west of Buffalo Bill's stage show didn't exist anymore. Pearl took a job as a cook and took in laundry, and then her husband showed up in town and begged her to take him back. They moved to Tucson and had another child who ended up back with Grandma at some point in this story. Most of the histories agree that Fred or Frank or whatever his name was took off again once the money ran out, this time to enlist in the military. He joined Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders in Cuba in the Spanish-American War. Pearl apparently told people she hoped her husband would be killed by the Spanish. In any case, by 1898, Pearl was living in the town of Mammoth, Arizona. She might have been working as a cook. She might have been running a brothel. She might have been the sole employee of said brothel. She fell in with a guy known as Joe Boot, but that is probably not his real name either. Pearl got a letter saying that her mother had fallen ill and needed money for medical bills. So Pearl and Joe decided to do what any reasonable couple would do in this scenario. They decided to rob a stagecoach. It was one of the last stagecoaches left in the West. It ran from Florence to Globe. 
It hadn't been robbed for years, so there was no shotgun rider, just a driver and salesman on board who would be flush with cash. The date was May 30th, 1899. Pearl cut her hair short, put on Joe's clothes, and packed a 38 revolver. Joe was armed with a Colt 45. The robbery went more or less according to plan. When the stagecoach stopped at a watering hole, Joe held the driver and passengers at gunpoint, while Pearl relieved them of $431. It's about $13,000 today. And then she felt sorry for the passengers, so she gave them each a dollar back for food. They took off toward Benson along the San Pedro River, and the stagecoach driver went off to tell the sheriff. It was at this point that Pearl and Joe's plan fell apart. It's not clear whether they got lost or just didn't know what they'd do once they robbed the stagecoach, or maybe this was some crazy plan to try and lose anyone who was following them. They spent several days wandering around southern Arizona, more or less in circles. A sheriff's posse finally caught up with them about a week later, surrounding Pearl and Joe as they slept. Now, the county jail in Florence didn't have facilities for a lady stagecoach robber, so Pearl ended up in Tucson, or possibly Globe. A national media frenzy followed. Cosmopolitan magazine described her as, quote, just the opposite of what would be expected of a woman stage robber, which I suppose makes all sorts of assumptions about what one expects when a woman robs a stagecoach. A local fan even brought her a bobcat cub as a pet, which apparently was okay with the jail because Pearl wasn't even kept in a regular jail cell. She was held in a room with lath and plaster walls, so you can guess where this story goes next. That October, Pearl carved an 18-inch hole in the wall, possibly with some help from the uh, friendly locals, or maybe she had another inmate helper. All the stories differ a little bit here. Anyway, she escaped. Two weeks later, she was captured in New Mexico and brought back for trial, along with Joe Boot, who never seems to get a real last name in this story. At the trial, Pearl played the sympathy card, telling the jury she needed the money to go help her sick mother. And that line worked. The jury acquitted both of them. The judge, however, was furious and had them rearrested. The second trial was apparently for interfering with U.S. mail, unless it was also for unlawfully carrying a gun. Regardless, that second jury was less sympathetic. Pearl and Joe were convicted. He got 30 years in prison. She got five. Neither would end up serving anything close to that. Joe escaped from the Yuma prison in 1901, and he was never heard from again. Pearl, however, loved the spotlight. The warden gave her a larger cell and a small yard where she would entertain reporters and guests. But by 1902, someone had had enough of Pearl's jailhouse antics. She may have gotten pregnant, which would, of course, be difficult for the warden to explain. The territorial governor pardoned Pearl on the condition that she leave the state. They let her out of prison and put her on a train to Kansas City. Pearl met up with her sister there, who'd written a play about Pearl's robbery, she starred in that play for a while. She might have joined up with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show or toured on the vaudeville circuit. It's not entirely clear what happened after that. She may have run a cigar store in Kansas City and died there in 1925. Some say she ended up in San Francisco, living until 1952. But most accounts put Pearl back in Arizona, and maybe that's just because that's the most romantic ending to this story. A census taker in 1940 claimed that she was living under the name Pearl Bywater, having married a rancher and finally settled down. And if that's the case, then Pearl Hart lived well into her 80s, a very long life for the only woman known to have robbed an Arizona stagecoach 120 years ago this week in Western history. That's it for this episode of Go West Young Podcast. Reminder that we're planning live episodes of the show this summer. We could head to Arizona or New Mexico or up to Wyoming or Montana. Send your ideas for topics and guests to podcast at westernpriorities.org. Thanks again to Micah Meyer for sharing the story of his epic road trip. A link to his website, of course, is in the show notes. And best of luck to you, Micah, as you adjust to life back in the real world. If you enjoyed this episode, please go leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or just share the episode with a friend. I'm Aaron Weiss, and on behalf of all of us at the Center for Western Priorities, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.